Hello and welcome back to the Big Scuba podcast. This is a bit of a special episode for us because it's not every day you get to talk to an astronaut from NASA. So there we are. Um, and also, it's also a bit special because we've got Scuba Honey here with us. She's going to be joining us, firing some questions. And Honey is representing not just my daughter, but St Edmund's Catholic Primary School from Me? Dundee. There we go. Show how tall my friends. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hello to everybody who's watching. So, uh, you know, it's really good. I uh, had to go through quite a few legal checks and things like that to get this far. So it took a while, but we were there. You, we're there. We're ready. <laughs> ready to, to go. Uh, and also, thank you very much to our lovely patrons who every month uh, dip into their pocket to help support and make this possible. And we've got a question coming up. Uh, from John, who's going to be representing those patrons, so thank you very much. Yeah, that's great. And also, we've got a big thank you to our great friend of the podcast, Christina Sonato. Um, so there'll be lots of links where you can find more details about Christina and People of the Water. It's a really great non-profit organisation uh, who will always need support, and we thought it'd be really great to uh, marry this episode up with NASA and uh, People of the Water and yeah. also to, under the hashtags of explore, educate and conservation we took this opportunity to marry things up with our local school, with St Edmunds School and that's why Honey's going to be firing some questions at Michael um, because the school um, have put, put together some questions okay, for us to ask yes yeah, so you're gonna have your first interview yeah how good is that Yours. so uh <laughs> so that's that so th i think they're the thank yous so with no further ado we'll have a countdown to mike uh but before we do that very quickly so mike uh, exceptional guy he's done loads uh done nine spacewalks uh flown the endeavor a space shuttle on sds 134 uh, he spent over just over a year in space and he's actually training and getting ready to fly the Boeing Starliner, which is their new spaceship. So we should be going out next year. Uh, yeah, early next year. So, uh, you know, he's a real life breathing astronaut being on nine spacewalks. And yeah. he's about to go up again. Yeah, ex uh, military pilot and also an engineer. So uh, fluent in Japanese and Russian. How about that? So uh, that's pretty good going. So anyway, enough of us running on. Let's have a countdown. So five, four, four three, three, two, two one. one. Firing chain is armed. House suppression water system is armed. Go for main engine start. Eight, seven, six. Zero and liftoff for the final launch of Endeavour. Expanding our knowledge, expanding our lives in space. Houston Endeavour, roll program. Roger roll, Endeavour. Houston is now controlling. Endeavour beginning to uh, roll over onto its uh, back. The roll program on the way as uh, Endeavour begins the heads down position on course for a 51.6 degree. 136 by 36 statute mile orbit. <laughs> we won't launch a rocket, but we'll launch the podcast. Awesome. Ready? Ready? Four, Four, three, two, one. Hello, I'm astronaut Mike Fink, and you're on the Big Scuba Podcast with Ian, Honey, and Gemma. Okay, um, so Mike, you're a paddy open water diver like Gemma and myself, and uh, did your paddy qualification help you become an astronaut? So I got my paddy uh, certification before I became an astronaut, and I think it helped me in uh, several ways, and I think it was a favorable thing on my astronaut application. Of course, NASA, we look at a lot of uh, different things, but 
the fact that I could, you know, put on gear and go into a strange environment, you know, we're not so really supposed to breathe underwater, Ian. I mean, it's not, it's not natural, but having a, you know, being able to, to overcome, you know, the innate fear and uh, to, to, to be able to wear your regulator and dive and, and go and forget that you're in a place where humans did not evolve and to enjoy it and to and and to be functional is a very very good skill because it's very similar to being in space we're not supposed to be there necessarily but we are and we do really well in space because uh, most humans are very adaptable and it's it takes special people to be uh, scuba not and it turns out just about everybody is special in terms of being able to to do scuba they just have to get over it so uh for for me uh it was uh it, i think my patty qualification helped me to become an astronaut and uh, and what it meant it, it showed that I could do uh, different things with uh, different gear and uh, there's a lot of things that we learn um, just in the basic uh, paddy course that uh, really translate well for space flight all the way from uh, you know you should take good care of your equipment because it takes care of you those kind of things that you learn when you, when you're diving is are really you know applicable to space flight and and that's why you know, NASA has special relationships. We we all feel that uh, we're we're great scuba divers. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> so NASA's Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, the NBL, tell us about it. How deep is it? Is it heated? What's in it? And why do you train underwater? Yes. So uh, it turns out that uh, we at NASA do not have a special room where we can push a button and become weightless. And yet when we're in space, uh, you know, and, and a lot of us, we stay up there for six months, uh, like Tim Peake, right? He was up there for about six months on, on his mission. And we, uh, we, we don't know how to be weightless. So uh, especially when we're doing in, important things like constructing a space station or fixing a Hubble Space Telescope. So we have to have a place where we can practice. And doing it underwater is very similar to being in space. Uh, being neutrally buoyant, uh, as everybody who's uh, ever had an opportunity to be scuba know that you know maintaining your buoyancy is a really important thing. But being neutrally buoyant underwater is very similar, and and the skills that we learn by practicing our spacewalks underwater translate and help us to uh, build things like the space station. In fact, uh, the International Space Station we went through and uh, we had uh, no injuries, no fatalities, anything like that when we when we were looking at building it in the late 1980s and early 1990s, we thought that it was going to be really dangerous. And it is, but uh, we were, you know, because we had such a good neutral buoyancy laboratory, it's heated, it's huge. It's a huge, huge swimming pool. Uh, it's a diving tank. It's about 62 meters, about 200 feet long, 100 feet wide, 31 meters. And uh, it's about 40 feet deep, 12.34 uh, meters. It holds uh, 23 and a half million liters of water, which is 6.2 million gallons. Uh, it's fresh water. I wouldn't taste it, or uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, sample it. But, uh, um, but it's, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, and it's heated. In fact, I think that was the biggest um, difference I, I knew on my. I did nine spacewalks, and uh, my very first spacewalk, I'm outside of the International Space Station, hanging on, and I'm saying, wow. This is just like the NBL because the the way that we make the spaceship a uh, space station look underwater. Oh, by the way, the space station is so big it doesn't even fit into one of the world's largest swimming pools. I mean, we have to uh, take it in little pieces and, and move it around a little bit just so that we can get uh, our spacewalks practice. I'm on the outside of the of the space station, hanging on, you know, 250 miles up, looking down, saying, "Well, what a long drop that would be." But I was feeling this is just like being at the neutral buoyancy laboratory. And uh, the most dip, uh, so it was, it was very similar. But one of the things that's different is when you're in space, you're going around the Earth. We go around every 90 minutes. It's hot. It's you know it, in the light parts. It's very hot. It gets up to about three or four hundred degrees. And at that point, you say, "Is that Celsius or is that Fahrenheit?" And it's like, "I don't care. <laughs> it's really hot." And then it gets really cold, and uh, like to negative 200. Same thing. I don't know. Centigrade Celsius. Celsius. Nice. It's still wicked cold. And, but in the MBL, it's always the same temperature. So that was the biggest difference in the reality. It wasn't the buoyancy, it wasn't the spacewalk uh, choreography, it was just it got hot and cold. And I, you know, sometimes we like to really uh, make our, our simulations very realistic, but I would not advise them to make the NBL that hot or that cold. 
So then uh, the spacesuits, they have to really contend with uh, the extreme hot and extreme cold, you know, uh, within a short period, I suppose. Yes, uh, Ian, that's, uh, that's, the, uh, th that's what makes making uh, spacesuits uh, very tricky. And uh, it, it's, we have a lot of very similar equipment inside, like regulators and pressure regulators. And, and uh, we don't quite have scuba tanks, but we have a big tank of, uh, of uh, we, we breathe pure oxygen. But it's not that much difference in some respects as, as a scuba suit or a dry suit, it, except that it has to be able to handle the vacuum of space. It needs to be pressurized inside and outside, and it has to handle the pressures. We also have some embedded Kevlar and other things so that uh, little micrometeoroids, if they hit us, we got armor. Uh, so that makes uh, our gear about about 300 pounds. It's quite heavy. Wow, that's heavy, isn't it? So when you started your training underwater, uh, did they start you off in a, a scuba dry suit or a wet suit? So were you straight into the, the suits when you first started uh, underwater in the laboratory? Yes, so uh, the, our, uh, our uh, sequence of events, and again, another reason why scuba is important, important to space flight, is that uh, we start out with, you know, when you start out with scuba, the first thing they make you do is what? The swim test. Yeah. Yes, we had to do a swim test too. And uh, at that time... Swim test. I'm sorry? 200 meter swim test. Yes, and uh, we also had a few other things where we had to practice... Um, where we had to uh, practice treading water and things like that. And at that time in my life, I was uh, less buoyant, uh, uh, less, uh, was it uh, more muscle and less fat. So I was the only one in the swim test. Uh, they couldn't see my, uh, my eyes were just barely above the water and my hands were above the water. So uh, good, those, I'm glad I don't have to take the swim test very often. Uh, so, so after the swim test, uh, they, they helped us get scuba certified for those astronauts select, who were selected who hadn't been certified already. And then we practice, uh, uh, certifi uh, we practice uh, spacewalking in, a scuba, in scuba gear, and then we w moved on to the suits. Now, we didn't do dry suits. Um, in fact, the, the NBL is quite uh, comfortable. So it was more like in a t-shirt and swim trunks and uh, than the standard scuba gear. We do have, uh, we do uh, at the NBL use uh, nitrox, which is you know, slightly enhanced uh, breathing gas that so has a little bit more oxygen in it, and that allows us to have a little bit more underwater time if we need to. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. So, how did it feel when you first went into the MBL with the spacesuit on? Was it? It was pretty. <laughs> it was pretty amazing because uh, you know you and and the funny thing is is that uh, what I really like about scuba is that uh, you're your own person. In other words, you put your own gear on. Of course, you go with the buddy. You always check your buddy. Your buddy checks you. But uh, you have some uh, you have some mobility. But when you're in a spacesuit, it's a very expensive, heavy piece of gear, and you can't move by yourself. So in fact, uh, when we practice our spacewalks underwater, uh, we don't move at all. We have people that move us to the space station. Uh, so we have divers. Yes, we. So for each uh, crew member underwater, we have at least three, sometimes four divers that are there to help us out. One. That has a safety the camera. Guys are seen with quintets on. Yes. Yeah, and they actually because you, if your suit weighs obviously quite heavy, you know, to move you, that's quite that can't be particularly easy. No, it isn't. Uh, so, but but once you get in the water, it's a, it, you know, and 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 we call it a way out. But they make us neutrally buoyant. Uh, they can actually swim us along and bring us along. Once we get on structure, like we do in space, we actually do our spacewalk, which is a movement of hand over hand uh, across the space station. And of course, we have uh, tethers that keep us to the uh, space station. So if we were to let go, we won't uh, uh, disappear into the darkness of space. Okay, cool. Astronaut Mike Fink here at the Johnson Space Center Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. I love my job. It's a great day to be an astronaut, great day to be part of uh, Team NASA, where we're uh, trying out new things for our new spaceship, Orion. You can see a mock-up of the capsule over there with the big NASA logo on it, and uh, it's going to land in water. 
And then what happens? Well, we're working on that. We have some great folks from the military, from the Air Force and Navy, and they're going to come rescue us and get us out of the capsule. So we're practicing that today in a nice, cool, calm water of the NBL here. And uh, then we're going to go practice it on the ocean, for real. And uh, so we're doing a step-by-step -step approach. And this is just another day in the office for me. Get to try on a new kind of spacesuit, try a new capsule out. Uh, it's great to be part of Team NASA. need to eat flies when you have a spacesuit on when you're in the I'm sorry you need to equalize when you have a spacesuit on uh, yes so uh, the uh, we we do need to equalize uh, a little bit uh, when we uh, in the NBL uh, in the uh, in the real spacesuit going out where it's actually almost the opposite uh, when you're uh, scuba diving or practicing spacewalks uh, you're getting into higher and higher pressure as you go down the water column and you need to equalize. Um, we have a, in, inside of our helmet, they have a small little sponge. They, they give it a special acronym like Valsalva device or BSD or something like that. And you can put your nose and we equalize because you can't, you can't grab because you're in a helmet. <laughs> it doesn't work very well. Uh, so, uh, so we have a, we have a small equalization device inside of our spacesuit. On the real day, it's actually almost the opposite because we're going uh, from uh, a, a pressurized environment to a less pressurized environment. So when we go out for a spacewalk, it's actually like ascending uh, after a dive. And when we come back in, it's like getting uh, pressurized, uh, like descending to so that we can come back from zero, um, uh, you know, zero pressure to one atmospheric pressure. So it's a little bit opposite. We do worry about uh, uh, in spacewalks, we do worry about getting the bends, right? Uh, decompression sickness. So all the things that we learn in the basic scuba courses, I think Gemma, you're going through it right now. It, it's really, we, we learn the same thing at NASA and in the space program. It's very applicable. Yeah, that's great. And do those suits, do they leak? Do you ever find sometimes you get a, like with our dry suit, sometimes you get back after you're like, your wrist is damp or, you know, do you ever get a leak in your suit? Oh, the, uh, the beauty of it, Ian, is that these are pressurized suits. So we are more pressure inside than outside. Oh, right. So okay. if, uh, the leaks that we worry about are not water coming in, which is theoretically possible, but highly unlikely. Uh, but we're more worried about uh, our air going out. So we have joints like our shoulder joints or our waist joint uh, below us, or even our glove joints. And if they are not put on right, or if there's even something as thin as a hair uh, on the on the on the joint, it will actually uh, we see little bubbles leak out. And sometimes we have to, uh, after going all the way down, you know, 40 feet to the bottom, we have to go all the way back up, and take off our our glove, and redo it, and then come back all the way down. And uh, for us, it's it's uh, just takes time. But the divers. You know, that's, uh, that's a lot of up and down and equalization, but we, we work with professionals. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're in the, in the MBL, how long are you underwater for? Is it very, or what's the longest you've been underwater? Uh, yes, so uh, they keep us underwater for six hours. And uh, real spacewalks uh, last, uh, can last a little bit longer, but uh, for six hours, it's actually three shifts of divers. Uh, each of our divers can only go under in, in the, you know, you diving tables, right? Uh, they can only stay under for about uh, about two hours. Mm -hmm. um, so six hours is three shifts. Brilliant. Okay. And um, you've been, uh, we want to talk a bit about the NEMO project um, that you've been involved in in 2002. NEMO 2, the NASA Extreme Environmental Mission Operations. Uh, in Florida, in Florida Keys, utilizing the Aquarius habitat. Can you tell us a bit about the NEMO 2 project? Ah, uh, yes, 20,000 millimeters under the sea. Uh, so uh, the Aquarius habitat belongs to um, a different uh, agency. So I'm with NASA, the American National Aeronautics and Space Administration. We also have a uh, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association, NOAA, and uh, they uh, they own and operate uh, a undersea habitat. It looks a lot like a space station module. It's a lot more beefy because it has to handle 
the pressure uh, from from the depths. And it's about 60 feet under underwater, about uh, 20 mil 20 meters or 20,000 millimeters. And uh, it's uh, fantastic because you can uh, once you uh, uh, stay under, you can stay saturated. Uh, so you uh, you can actually um, and you stay at that pretty much that depth the whole time. And that means uh, you can uh, stay as long as you can find food and air, which the habitat has. Uh, you can stay underwater for weeks at a time. Uh, our mission, we stayed for about one week, somewhere between about about six days underwater. And that meant that each day we could go outside and scuba uh, for four or five or six hours. So can you imagine uh, uh, you know, every day scuba diving for six or seven hours, not having to worry about the dive tables too much? Uh, things like that because you stayed under the whole time yeah. and it was it was pretty amazing um, the uh, the facilities were uh, in, in other words the the toilet was outside uh, so if you had to uh, get up in the middle of the night and uh, take care of business you actually had to put on your wetsuit and go outside and and uh, it was quite interesting uh, different than space because space doesn't have any fish uh, floating around uh, but underwater, there certainly was quite a few, uh, a lot of um, a, a lot of wildlife, and it was just uh, absolutely amazing to to be underwater to get that much scuba time, and uh, yet at every moment it was an extreme environment. If we decided uh, to just j just uh, because we were so saturated, uh, it means the nitrogen bubbles were not in our in our bloodstream anymore. If we decided to just uh, jump up and uh, go to the surface, it would have killed us with decompression sickness. Yeah. Uh, it, it would have been a, a, a surety. So we had to be very careful. Even though we were only 60 feet down, uh, it was very dangerous to go to the surface. So these these kind of things are, you know, great training for astronauts who are going into space. Uh, it's a lot less, uh, it's a, a a lot less uh, cost for us because this cost to go to space is, is still quite expensive. So living underwater and scuba diving is a great uh, economical alternative for space training. So next time you're out uh, scuba diving, friends out there, uh, just uh, remember that uh, you're practically in space. Yeah, that's yeah, amazing. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> so Jacques Cousteau did a similar thing in 1966 on the Conshell 3 project. So do you find yourself thinking about that when you're... Uh, we, we, we did, and, and the fact that uh, Jacques Cousteau and, and his team that helped with this Aqualung concept, right, which we call scuba, self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, right? Uh, and uh, uh, would you, if we stayed with Aqualung, would you have kept your, your name to the big Aqualung uh, podcast or would have been the big scuba project? And anyway, so yes, we did think about Jacques Cousteau and, and, and his voyages of, uh, of exploration. Uh, we turns out, and when we were underwater, we were just absolutely fascinated because we were always, as astronauts, we always have our eyes up to the sky. But it turns out that I think we know certain parts of Mars and certainly the moon much better than we know our own oceans. And Jacques Cousteau helped us recognize and learn more about the world that we live in. Mm. Oh, that's brilliant. So did living underwater, um, did that re sort of help with your time in space? Do you find that? You know, when you when you're underwater for like six days, wasn't it? You know, you find that really helped with the whole mindset of going to be away in space. Yes, um, we lived. Uh, there were there were six of us in a in one one module, the Aquarius habitat, and it was very similar to living aboard the space station. Space station actually. We have six people, but it's, we have uh, about eight or nine modules, so it's a lot. Uh, so it's a lot, uh, uh, a lot more room. But we still, with the same things apply. You have to live with other people. You have to. You can't just leave your clothes lying around. You have to eat at a certain time. Sometimes you like the food. Sometimes you don't. Uh, all these, all these little things that add up to uh, uh, living and working in a in extreme environment. We did it underwater, and it was so similar in space. And I hadn't flown in space yet, and I did. Uh, I did remember, you know, on my first space mission, especially saying, "Wow, this Nemo helps out very much." So we were the first operational uh, mission, meaning that in the early 2000s, NASA was saying, "Is this Nemo thing it could work? Could it not work?" Uh, we're up up to I think Nemo 23 or 24 now. So every year or two, we uh, we we do another exploration, send another team down. And we've evolved to practicing living on lunar habitats uh, because we can actually uh, put the weights uh, on people so that it makes them feel like they're actually 
uh, on the moon in terms of the lunar gravity. There's so many things that you can do underwater and, and this is why scuba is so important. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So with you going on your scuba journey and you have ultimately ended up in space, are your children kind of keen to take up scuba or are they into snorkeling? Yes, I have uh, three children and uh, my oldest is uh, 19 and my youngest is 12. And uh, uh, they're all in uh, the scouting program. And uh, the scouting programs offer the ability to, uh, to get scuba trained. And I think uh, since I became a, uh, I think uh, uh, I be, since I got certified, Patty offers, I guess, a recreational level where it's just several hours uh, to get introduced. And I think I'll do that with my younger ones. My older one already has his, uh, his, his, his dive certificate. And I was very happy that he went to do it. And it wasn't so that he would be a future astronaut. I don't think that's where his path will go. But you learn so much about how to uh, handle yourself in a strange environment. And I think this is something all people should know. Um, and it's, uh, and again, paying attention to your equipment and being operationally oriented. And then also getting to explore our own planet and seeing some amazing, amazing things that you will never see on, on, on if you just stay in your own garden the whole time. And uh, he got his uh, certification in California where they had these huge kelp forests. And he came back so excited. Dad, did you know there's these big things and they're called kelp? And then it's like, of course, son, I know these things, but I'm glad you know them now too. Yeah, you just can't yeah, convey it until you see it. It's just, yeah, magical. Yeah. Mm. Right, so Bungie, primary, uh, Bungie has got a primary school called St. Edmund's Catholic Primary School. Honey's in year six, and they put together some questions that Honey is going to ask you. Um, Hello again, Honey. The first one <laughs> is, how and where do you go to the toilet? Yes, in space. Um, I think uh, we are a little bit more um, uh, careful about than we were in the Aquarius habitat. So we did, just didn't uh, do it out in, outside. Uh, so in space, we actually have special space toilets. And uh, most Western countries, such as the UK and the and United States and Canada and, and uh, in Europe, you have a toilet, right, and uh, a potty, and it has uh, water in it and gravity, right? The gravity helps. So you can deposit whatever you want into the water. You hit the flush, and it goes away. And uh, in space, it doesn't work that way. Water is very expensive. Each liter that we take costs, oh, I don't know, about 7,000 pounds, you know, $10,000. So we're very careful about our water. So we actually have a special uh, uh, space toilet. It doesn't have gravity, so we have a vacuum suction. So it's like a we turn on a little motor uh, before we go, and it makes a noise, just like a vacuum cleaner. Uh, we deposit our liquid waste, right? Uh, I think you might understand the concept of number one and number two. Uh, <laughs> yes. So the number one, the liquid waste, the P, uh, it goes into a we, it goes into a funnel, and we keep all of our urine separate. And then the solid waste uh, goes into a different uh, container. It's its own contained little uh, bag and uh, like a little plastic bag. And um, you never touch it. You might see it a little bit, and you just uh, move it, and it stays into a big metal container. What we do with the urine is really important because water is so expensive. We recycle it. We take all the water out of the urine and are left with this salty, yucky brine. We never touch it. Um, but then we take all the water out of the urine, we purify it, we pasteurize it, we distill it, and then it turns into pure water. And then we use that water for things like making air, H2O, right? Uh, we take out, we add electricity, we get the oxygen out. We use it for drinking. And uh, yes, yeah, so some days you're drinking uh, yesterday's coffee and today's coffee. <laughs> <laughs> what you can do with it. Brilliant. Okay. Recycle, recycle. <laughs> um, question number two. Do you get hot at the temperature? Yes. We have uh, inside the space station, the International Space Station, um, it is uh, very the same temperature the whole time. I don't know, somewhere around 24C, which is 73 or 74 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's uh, so it's a nice temperature the whole time. In fact, it's so boring because it's never hot. It's never cold. It's never rainy. It's, it's always the same. Uh, um, but on, uh, but that's a, because of 
uh, fine aerospace engineering because outside the space station, like I mentioned before, it gets up to 400 degrees when you're inside the sunlight and 45 minutes later you're in the dark and it gets uh, negative 200 or 300 degrees. So the, the outside the temperature is changing quite a bit, inside it isn't. And that's what makes the designing a spacesuit really tricky is that you're inside your own little space station. Amazing. And the whole time you're flying at seven seventeen thousand miles an hour, isn't it? Seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour. Yes. We go around the planet, uh, planet Earth, uh, every ninety minutes, and we can see some amazing things. Um, question number three: When you took your first fake walk, did it make you feel as if you were taking giant stride into the tree? And how did it make you? Yes, spacewalks. Not every astronaut gets to do them. So I was very lucky uh, to be able to, to do nine spacewalks. In fact, my first six spacewalks were in a Russian spacesuit. It turns out that um, in university, I studied Russian language, and it turned out that was uh, very useful. And because I can speak Russian pretty well, they allowed me to go outside in their spacesuits, as well as fly in their spacecraft. Um, so then I also did American spacewalks and American spacesuits, and they're similar and, and yet different. But the first one was in Russian spacesuit, and I guess like uh, the first time you take a scuba dive, you know, in your gear and everything like that, you, you're either on the side of the boat or on the pool and you take your first stride. For us, it's a much more controlled thing, but it was equally exciting as we open the hatch and climb outside the door and look down, you know, 250 miles below and say, oh my goodness, I'm going, you know, I'm around planet Earth going 17,500 miles an hour. And at first you, you your hands say, you know, I want to let go because you think you're going to fall, but of course you're not going to fall, but it's still one of those uh, reflexes you have and you have to convince yourself, no, this is okay, this is normal, just go and do your business, and uh, we did. So we, every spacewalk is, is very exciting, but there's something always special about the first. Yeah. Crew's now beginning to do, go through some of the cleanup steps that they need to wrap up the last of this activity. They had originally intended to have Mission Specialist Mike Fink take the old grapple fixture, which uh, wasn't compatible with the space station's robotic arm, that they have just replaced and take that uh, and store it in the space shuttle's cargo bay for return home. But to save time, they're going to have him bring it inside instead and, and possibly it will be brought home uh, during, during the STS-135 mission. After we dropped off the EFTF, so I'm looking for a total of looks like three rats internal. Four rats, one is empty. Okay, copy. That sounds good. What speed does the International Space Station travel at? Yes, 17,500 miles an hour. And that's an important number because the rockets have to get up to that speed because that defines how far above Earth we go. If we decide to add a little extra rocket on the back of the space station and go uh, faster, we'll go, our altitude will go higher because it's, uh, it's one big uh, thing. And if you keep adding a little bit of energy, you're gonna go higher and higher and eventually you'll get to the moon. And so, but we stay really low, right above the Earth's atmosphere uh, that way, it costs less energy to send up all of our resupplies. Our resupplies are important things like food and water and clothing and scientific experiments. So mm -hmm. 17,500 miles an hour is a really important number. And I think that turns out to be about 28,000 kilometers per hour. So I know, uh, Ian, maybe Gemma, you, you you drive very fast on the motorway. No, uh, you know, no, I can't go that fast. No, no. <laughs> There's any police watching this, it's all... No, no. <laughs> well, they should try to catch us someday. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they were like camera. <laughs> right. um, question number four Is it true that the Earth looks mainly blue from space? Yes. Uh, it's, it's an interesting blue, though, uh, when we fly uh, because uh, the, the, the blue comes, I guess, from the from the, the sunlight uh, through the atmosphere. And, uh, but it, when we are up in space, the light actually has to go from the sun through the atmosphere once and then back up to us through the atmosphere so we could see it. So it ends up to be more of a blue gray instead of a you know, pale blue, it's more of a blue gray. But most of, our, most of our planet is covered by water. I mean, most being 70 something percent. And so we were a lot, most of our orbit uh, for International Space Station is over water. And um, it does make us wonder, you know, why we know so much about other planets and not everything 
yet about our, our planet Earth. So more scuba divers out there, we will learn uh, more about our own planet ourselves. This is a question from um, Which country looks the biggest from space? Now, um, I'm uh, talking to you from uh, Texas. Um, the, one of the largest states in the United States. And I think my Texan friends are supposed to say, Texas is the biggest country from space. But I have to explain to them that Texas is not a country. <laughs> so the beauty of it is, is, honestly, honey, is that when you're uh, in space, that you look at the earth and it's not like a globe. There are no lines, there's no country names, there's no borders. So you don't know what country you're over unless you're unless you know geography pretty well and you can guess right you can always tell when you're at the tip of south america we're flying over india and of course the uk is quite beautiful from space a lot of clouds though always a lot of clouds but uh but uh you 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 really don't know so you you don't you know, so we just look at it and we just have kind of one planet that all human beings live on and uh, without seeing the borders we can say you know it makes us wonder when we're up there why we fight so much down here. Mm -hmm. I saw on a, another interview you made a while ago that you saw your parents house or roughly where roughly where they are then? Uh, yes I, uh, I did fly uh, over my hometown and it was at night and so I, I couldn't see my parents house but uh, I could tell where that, you know, because we live along a, a river in the state of uh, Pennsylvania, the city of Pittsburgh, I could tell approximately where they were. I couldn't see the individual house. Um, and uh, but uh, but my I was talking to my father on the phone and he could look up and see me and I could look down. I couldn't see him. Awesome. But it was uh, I, I felt very close to my father. I always do. But especially at that moment. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah. Question three. Do you get scared in space? Aha, another reason why scuba is really important. Because scuba is really, it's a safe uh, uh, occupation, it's a safe thing to do, um, but it is a little bit scary. And if you can overcome your fears of being underwater and, and learning to enjoy the experience, that's the same kind of process that we have in flying in space. And uh, that's what's... Uh, that's what's uh, really beautiful uh, uh, about it is that it is a scary thing, but I don't think I was scared ever. I, I really don't just because it was such a wonderful, amazing experience, surreal to be in the International Space Station, surreal to be outside. And uh, I couldn't believe it was happening to me. But uh, no, I, I, maybe I'm not smart enough to be scared, um, but uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't scary. It was just exciting. Mm. Oh, that's great. Um, um, what is taking off in a rocket really like? So I've taken off in two different rockets. One was a Soviet, a Russian Soyuz, and the other one was American Space Shuttle. And next year, maybe about this time, uh, maybe a little bit sooner, I'll be taking off in a third rocket on a on a different uh, spaceship. And it's really exciting that you're sitting there. You, know, you say, I can't believe there. I can't believe it's finally here. The day. And they count down three, two, one, blast off. And for me, it's more of an emotional experience than a physical experience. Of course, you're starting at zero miles an hour and you're going to end up at 17,500 miles an hour. And it all takes about 10 minutes. Uh, the um, Russian Soyuz took nine, the American space shuttle took eight and a half. My new rocket's gonna take 10 or 11 minutes, but eventually it all happens very quickly. Uh, along the way, you feel some G-force. In other words, you're accelerating, and it pushes you back in your seat. Um, just like when Ian drives, I'm sure, he hits, hits the, oh, the accelerator. <laughs> so uh, we go... Uh, <laughs> we go three, we go, uh, the, we get to about three, three and a half G's. Um, I come from a military airplane background where we get to uh, nine G's flying in an F-16. So three G's, it's, it's okay, but it's not that, it's not that exciting. Uh, but being inside of a, uh, uh, on top of a rocket and uh, accelerating, uh, it's going into space is super exciting. So it's more of a happy feeling than anything else. Yeah. Great. Um, I've, I've already <laughs> but, um, oh, I know what nebulas are. They are uh, those. Are, they're like uh, gas clouds when when um, when stars explode, for example. And uh, they're quite beautiful, colorful. 
And uh, but we don't see them in space. I think uh, when you watch uh, the movies and things like that, they show those things because they want to make it even more exciting. Yeah, so you can't see uh, them in space. Well, we could if you had a telescope. See, the thing is, Ian, uh, they they're like millions and millions and billions of of kilometers miles away, and we're only like 300 miles closer to them on top. So they're not they're not going to be. No, the one thing we don't have is atmospheric. Uh, blur, right? Because the atmosphere uh, makes things a lot more blur blurrier. And that's why things like the Hubble Space Telescope um, can see things a lot better just because there's no atmosphere. But it's not because we're that much closer. So if we had a telescope up, up in space, but most of our windows on the space station are pointed down and not up uh, because we're always looking, we're fascinated by, by planet Earth. So if I had a telescope uh, in um, in, in space and I wanted to look at a nebula, you could look along Orion's belt, there's the, you know, the Orion Nebula, that's always a good one to see. But I've never seen one in space. Okay. Um, what was it like being on a Star Trek? Haha, <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's, uh, it's really interesting, uh, uh, the, the, the people uh, that you get to meet when you're an astronaut. And honestly, I'm very fascinated by by meeting by meeting you three today. It's uh, it, it, it's because there's so many interesting people out there. So uh, I happen to meet um, the the uh, actor who plays uh, Jonathan Archer, which is a Enterprise uh, one of the Enterprise captains, uh, Captain Archer, uh, played by Scott Bakula. And I went to I went and saw the set and how they did things. And for me, it was, it was fascinating because it was equally complex to make a, um, a TV show or even a, a, a movie uh, that makes people believe that it's real than it is to actually actually make things that are real. So at NASA, we do it for real. And when we're, if you ever were to come inside of one of my spaceships, one of the first things I would tell you besides being nice and saying, welcome, we're glad you're here. But the next thing would be, don't touch anything. <laughs> because all the buttons, all the buttons are real, and and they could affect things like the one might take away your oxygen or or something like that, right? You don't want to do that. Uh, but those uh, on set, you could touch whatever buttons you want because they were all fake. Yeah. Everything, <laughs> everything that they did was just uh, it was just the magic to make it look real. But it was uh, not. It was um, it it was all fake, and that's why I came back with appreciation for what we do at NASA and what we do with the, the world space programs said what we do with something is really tough and it's real. We're really up there. We're really doing things and it costs a lot of money and it costs a lot of effort, but it's something worthwhile that human beings should be doing. Of course, I love watching a good movie or TV show and it, it inspires us to do the real things in space. Yeah. Yeah. That must be amazing to see, uh, you know, the things that you've seen and also, you know, to do the things that you've done. So, uh, it's brilliant that NASA does that, so it's great. Um, also, we, what we want to do as well, just say thank you to our lovely patrons uh, who helped support make our podcast happen. Um, and on behalf of our patrons, uh, our friend John has asked us a question to ask you, and that would be, um, you'd like to know how close diving is to actual weight. Well, a big hello to John. And uh, and would like to say that um, it is quite similar. I already mentioned one of the differences, right? Everything is the same. You and all the maneuvers that we do when we are uh, practicing our spacewalks underwater um, are very similar. I mean, they're quite applicable to when we're in in uh, in space. It is. There's nothing better outside of real of really doing it uh, than than what we have set up at the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. It's uh, it's quite amazing. The Russians have a similar setup, by the way, called the the Hydro Lab. I've I've dived there too, but it's uh, it's quite similar, except the temperature difference, and that's something we can't model. Yeah, you know, uh, the the divers would not be happy about that. All of a sudden, we're going to get cold. Now we're going to get hot. Now we're going to get cold. So that would uh, that wouldn't work out very well. And another difference is uh, there is a water resistance. So as I move along in the pool, I'm I'm, I'm fighting against the resistance of the water. So I, I, I calibrate my muscles to do, go at a certain strength. And you can always tell a first time spacewalker as they're out there because all of a sudden they're going too fast because there's no resistance. Yeah. But we learn how to adapt and, and you can see after the first hour or so, everybody's moving along at a, at a very uh, energy efficient 
pace because you're out there for seven hours, no food. We do have a little drink bag in there that we can drink a little bit of water and that's it. Uh, so we have to uh, uh, shepherd our, our energy and, and, and those, the, those of us with a lot of experience, you learn how to be very efficient and very fast without having to move super fast. Yeah, no, that's great. Yep, we've got a, a super great friend of the podcast called Christina Zanato. She's a shark behaviorist, an ocean and cave explorer. And she has asked us to ask you a question. Which is the one message you want to be remembered by? Well, uh, hello to Christina and uh, thank you for your support. And uh, one of the, uh, and I've, uh, I've lived on, in caves and got, done cave exploring too. And we just have such a wonderful, beautiful planet. So my message that uh, I think, I don't know if I'd be remembered by me, sounds like I'm going away. No, I'm not. I'm going up in, on the space station, but that's not that far away. Uh, but is that uh, as human beings, uh, we really should be nice to each other. Uh, we should get along. We should uh, focus our efforts to be constructive and not destructive. We have a whole universe to explore. I think Christina knows this and, and any anybody who's been underwater, we know that uh, that you know, this earth is, is just magnificent. So we don't need to be fighting over little parcels of land and, and philosophies. We should just be exploring what we have here on this planet and the rest of the solar system together. Hi, I'm NASA astronaut Mike Fink, and I'm very excited about our country's vision for the 21st century space program. First, we have our beautiful International Space Station. And aboard this orbiting laboratory, we make new scientific discoveries every day. And working with our industry partners, we're developing new ways to transport crews, astronauts, from here in America, and having launched from different launch pads all over this planet to the beautiful International Space Station. I'm very excited that through the commercial crew program that we are returning launch capability back to the United States, launching from Florida's Space Coast to the Space Station and returning back to the United States. And that allows us at NASA to focus on beyond low Earth orbit to the moon and asteroid and, and even Mars. And we have a new big rocket, the SLS, Space Launch System, uh, paired with the multi-purpose crew vehicle called Orion on top. And that will allow us to explore our solar system like never before. How cool is that? ask all our guests uh, a set of questions okay and uh, that kind of brings us towards the end of the uh, podcast and um, we'd like to see what you think but we've tailored these questions for more outer space type environment okay um, you've seen space you've seen the earth from space from all angles have you picked out your next dive site ah uh, this is this is such a good uh a, a, such a good question because you understand us uh, very well because when we're up there that's what we're doing we're looking down at planet earth we're seeing all these amazing places for example i've never been south of the equator i mean i've flown over it you know uh, you can count how many times 16 times a day times 381 days uh you know thousands and thousands of times but my feet have never touched south of the equator so uh, and when we're up there, we're actually looking at places to go explore and maybe share with our families and things like that. So uh, what I think I would like to do, my next uh, dive location would be somewhere south of the equator. Maybe Australia and the Great Barrier Reef, somewhere off of New Zealand. Uh, and there's some amazing small islands in the Atlantic Ocean that are south of the equator that are you know kind of halfway between between South America and Africa that just little little blot of land out there and it's like wow talk about being uh, uh um uh, so far away in the middle of nowhere i think they're farther away than we are a lot of times aboard the space station so i think one of those places would be great to, to take my family and, and and to explore the ocean together yeah. um when i when when you were up in the space do you ever think about other forms of life? Yeah, we uh, we wonder, right? This is a, a great um, a great philosophical uh, debate, and we always wonder, right? Are there other people out there? Are there other aliens, creatures, and what are they like? And uh, 
that's why we should go explore the universe because it is so big and we are so small on this planet and we're like little kids squabbling over things here when we can go explore and, and see what that other life is like and are they based on dna or how do they you know how do they reproduce do they build great cities do they have technology that can help us do we have technology that can help them and uh, it would be great to to know but space is so big we have a lot of engineering problems to, to come to, to to learn how to travel in great distances in a short amount of time. And we haven't figured those things out. So we can't even get to the moon. It takes three days to go to the moon. It takes six months to go to Mars and Mars is really close. So we have a we have a lot of things to learn. So maybe honey you can help us uh, help us come up with a warp drive or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's good. Um could you name up to three people you would like to take to the International Space Station? They could be past and present or present, and why you take them there? Uh, so up to three people. See, the thing is, is that uh, I, have, uh, I have three children and a wife, and if I could just take my whole family with me, I don't think I'd ever come back, to be honest. We'd just stay up there, maybe build our own little starship. we we'll use Honey's uh, star drive and go explore the whole universe. <laughs> That would be uh, that would be really fun. Um, so, but if philosophically, you know, if we could bring any world leader up there with us, and 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 people who have uh, political power, and then they take a look at our planet from space, there's that overview effect, and I think it affects everyone. And then you realize that hey, we we are just one big, not happy always, but we are one big family of of human beings on this planet, and we need to take good care of our planet. Yeah, nice answer. That's good. Um, we all have our favourite bits of dive equipment um, that we like to have with us all the time. But have you got one luxury that you always take with you into space? Yes. Um, one of the things uh, to be on a long expedition is that you need to know yourself. You need to know what makes you grumpy, what makes you happy, uh, so that you can integrate well with your teammates and enjoy the experience. So for me, I need to read. Uh, so I like to read science fiction. I like to read literature. I like to read. So if I did not have an electronic book uh, with me up in space, some some kind of book reader, um, it would be very uh, it, w it would be very uh, difficult for me. I'd be a lot more grumpy. Uh, and so I think that uh, I think having one of those, even if I go on a you know on a, on a trip to a different country or anything, I, I still have a little book reader, whether it's on my on my telephone or a little Kindle reader or something like that, it's important. On uh, my very first mission, the NASA asked, well, we, we'll send up some books with you. How many would you like, four or five? And I said, no, <laughs> paper books, no. I'll, I'll, that's, I'll, I'll be over the winter a week with four or five paper books. So I had to sh show NASA that there were these, back in the early 2000s, that there were these things called electronic books. And since then, uh, they've been able to uh, help uh, everybody with uh, movies and electronic books and things like that to help us keep, um, you know, to be able to have some downtime so that during the day when we are on our mission and, and, and doing well, that we would be at our best. Yeah, that's great. And that was a renovation here in about the uh, Kindles, I'm sure to ask. I'm sorry? I'm sure it's a renovation here about a Kindle for NASA. Oh yes, boy, that was, uh, it was it's funny. We helped invent the technology, but uh, <laughs> then we have to explain it to, <laughs> explain it to the agency. There are these things that we helped invent that could help yeah. us up in space. Oh, brilliant! Okay, um, if you could have a billboard that is in space that's so big uh, to advertise planet Earth. Whether it be a statement, an image, a question, a quote, but you want to get the message out there to the galaxy and beyond, what would you put on it? Oh boy. So I'd have to make it Earth. something like uh, Dear Wonderful People of Planet Earth, uh, we have such a beautiful planet. Let's take good care of it and explore space together. But that sounds kind of cheesy, so I'd have to make it sound really awesome, like join the Space Corps and go, go and, and explore the universe or... Uh, the space Force. Yeah, there we go. Oh yeah, I guess we got one of those now. But it, it's more of a, it's more of a, uh, it's more of a, uh, 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 something to say, hey, forget about your small problems and let's, let's focus on working together because it is, 
amazing what uh, the universe looks like. And that's what I, I think scuba is. Scuba is, is, a, is a way to, for us to learn and explore our planet even better. And uh, those of you who have, uh, out there in, in podcast land who have been under, you, you will know that uh, what I'm talking about, to see new things, like my son's revelation that there's a kelp forest, um, or to uh, my first time that I saw a lobster actually living under the sea. I always thought they lived in the fish tanks and, and you know, the, those tanks inside the restaurant. Uh, and uh, so there's so many things to explore. And that's, uh, and, and that's what scuba, you can, you can become your own explorer. It's not that expensive. It's not that scary. And uh, my hats are off to you for helping, uh, helping folks across the planet, especially in the UK, to, uh, to get off their couches, to get out of their gardens and, and go explore. Get involved. Yeah, have fun as well. That's the main thing. Yeah, that's good. So uh, earlier we uh, just touched on um, films. What is your favorite space film that you like to watch? Hmm. There are a lot of good ones out there. And I, I can't say I have a favorite, but I will share one that I really liked. And uh, one of the ones I really liked was, uh, it was called The Martian, right? It was about this uh, guy who got stuck on a planet, on planet Mars, right? And he figured out how to come back and he ate potatoes and, and things like that. He used his uh, poo. I, I'm sorry? He used his poo, didn't he? To, to, yes, uh, yes, he did. to yes, he did. It's a good fertilizer, apparently. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. but it showed you know, human ingenuity. Uh, I like that movie. But the real reason I, I, I can point out a few technical flaws, um, and, uh, but that's what we astronauts do. Uh, but, but on the other hand, what I liked it was I watched it with my, my family. And I think for the very first time, my children actually understood the kind of thing that I do. Uh, they, they didn't really realize that, uh, that, I, that when I go to, go to the office, that I'm doing all of these other things. And I felt bad, maybe I wasn't sharing with them, or maybe they just didn't, you know, they're just young, they didn't have the ex exposure. So I think that movie, uh, that film, The Martian, uh, um, um, gave my children things to think about and made them want to go explore yeah. and to, to investigate things and to study science and, and maths and engineering and just learning more about the world around them. And so my hat's off to the folks that make that movie. Mm -hmm. And other movies that inspire us to be uh, better people and and to go uh, find out more about the universe around us. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. No, that's good. And just sort of on the film or the media side, do you have a favorite space song? Yes, uh, one one that we did for our last shuttle mission uh, was um, it was uh, on STS one thirty four, and it was the last time that Endeavour flew, and it became kind of our crew. A uh, theme song called "The Final Countdown." Oh, really? It was, For you? Yeah, it was uh, electronica from the I guess nineteen eighties. Uh, the band was Europa. Yeah, um, it's very catchy. Uh, we so that's one of my favorites. But I also like the one uh, where it talks about uh, that uh, it, it gives a countdown, just like Honey did it to start off the show. You know, four, three, two, one. Earth below us, drifting, falling, floating, weightless, calling, calling home. And I think that's a uh, that's a beautiful song uh, uh, to think about because it is beautiful to float weightless. And uh, we, you know, even though I love being in space, I've spent over a year of my life there. There's no place like coming home. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. You want to go? Thanks, Christina. Yeah. And yeah. um, so obviously, Christina gave us a, a, a couple of other questions, um, which we may have touched on slightly before. She said, what is the one thing you have observed from space that has made you realize the importance of protecting our planet? One thing that I, I, uh, I knew scientifically and I had studied it um, in, in university, but I didn't really appreciate it till I saw it with my own eyes. And uh, we have an atmosphere and we, around Earth, and that's good because that's what we breathe. Um, and uh, we look up and we think the atmosphere goes forever. But when you're uh, flying above planet Earth, you can see that the atmosphere is so thin compared to the rest of the planet. It is really incredibly thin. And if we don't take care of our atmosphere, then we're not going to be able to breathe very well. And you can you know, keep as many nitrox tanks at home as you want, but that's not going to last you super long if uh, your atmosphere is polluted. So uh, there's things that, uh, that really you can see from space. And you can also see some ocean 
pollution and things like that. So we need to, we really need to take care of our planet. And the thing that got me though was how thin our atmosphere is and how delicate balance mm -hmm. that we're on. And uh, when you're down here, it's really hard to see that. Yeah. yeah. And what does exploration mean to you? Yeah, exploration uh, is, is, I think, really important for human beings to do. In fact, I think that's one of the reasons why we're here, uh, to use our, our, our brilliant big brains uh, to, to understand the universe around us. And the more we understand the universe around us, the better we can make our lives here on planet Earth. Uh, for example, we figured out this thing called electricity, and uh, you know this uh, great uh, British scientist uh, James Clerk Maxwell figured out the Maxwell equations, which gave us you know uh, things like radio and television and things like that. Uh, so, but uh, electricity helps us uh, to conquer the night. We don't have to go to bed at, when it turns dark and get up when the, as soon as the sun comes up. We, uh, we have so many things, that, and the people would say that life is better on planet Earth because of electricity. So the more we explore, the more things that we learn about our universe, the better off we can make life here on planet Earth. And that's what exploration means to me. Brilliant. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. So it's been really... Have you got any questions for us? Well, uh, uh, next time I find myself in the UK, I'd love to stop by and, and visit and uh, say hello. Uh, and uh, and uh, when do you think this uh, podcast may uh, make airing? Because I'll I'll start I'll subscribe to your to the podcast and listen to on my way as I drive into the NBL and get ready to do my my dives. Awesome. Yeah, we've just got to edit it and then we've got to get it back over to John to have all the okay about it and then hopefully by the end of the week. Super. I look forward to it. And it was quite a pleasure to meet you. I hope our paths cross again. And uh, who knows. Um, maybe we'll see you all in space someday. Hopefully. Yeah, you'll see Honey. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, after she invents the warp drive, she's going to be yeah. rich and famous. Okay.